Hi, it's Vanita. Today on Don't Call Me Resilient, we're bringing you a special Best Hits episode. We've now put out 65 episodes over seven seasons, and we thought it would be fun to take a look back at what we've done. This is what we're calling like a flashback episode where I've got some producers on the air with me and each one of the producers have chosen a favorite episode to talk about today. And then throughout the summer, we're going to be playing the full episodes every two weeks. So joining me in the virtual studio are three Don't Call Me Resilient producers. They are Jennifer Morose, Atika Kaki, and Daniel Piper. Even reading their names, I feel excited. These guys are amazing. This podcast would never happen without them. So hello and welcome to you all. Good to be here. Jennifer, you are the first one to enter the scene in the Don't Call Me Resilient space. That's besides me, I guess. I can't believe we've done 65 episodes. And I was listening to earlier ones today, and I could really hear the fact that I was in the closet. So, because that was right smack in the middle of COVID. Do you remember, Jen? Yeah, I do. Everybody was trying to make do in podcasts, and all of a sudden recording became possible at home, which really changed the industry, too. Jen, when you joined Don't Call Me Resilient, you had just finished a long stint at CBC. The listeners are maybe for the first time are getting to hear a little bit about who helps produce this podcast. I had 13 years at the CBC. Prior to that, I was a newspaper reporter, actually, in the States, which I think I was still doing when I first met you, Vanita. We taught journalism together in Rwanda as part of a media development initiative back in 2008. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot that we met in Rwanda. Yeah. So when I joined Don't Call Me Resilient, it was after 13 years at the CBC where I used to run The Current and I did the redevelopment of Q when Tom Power came in as host, amongst other things. And then I did podcast development there, including Front Burner and Party Lines. So we're making our sort of beginning of the podcast sound kind of calm. But (laughs) we're using our best calm voices. Yeah. But we've been doing this podcast since the depths of the pandemic. And even though we started to plan the podcast before 2020, everything suddenly shut down. And all of a sudden, this conversation that I wanted to have about race and had been doing at the conversation through articles every week, it all of a sudden became like, a really crucial COVID and the pandemic and race, it felt like a life and death situation. Thousands of people were dying from COVID and there was a disproportionate amount of racialized people, Black folks dying from COVID, and there were all kinds of reasons for this. And then, of course, we actually hit upon the real life and death situation of the murder of George Floyd. It just became this moment, these global protests were happening that had to do with Black Lives Matter and the awareness of race and the pain of racism and this massive health crisis that we were also in the middle. And so I got this grant to do this podcast and I really needed help. And that's just around the time when you first came in, right, Jen? Mm -hmm. And by that February, we had our first season underway. And it was a different podcast back then. At the beginning, we were tackling these big societal issues through this anti-racist lens. You all know Vanita now, but Vanita, aside from being a kick-ass journalist, is also an expert in critical race theory, which comes through in all of her interviews, but also what comes through is her ability to to translate that for an audience. That's good to hear because, you know, it's really hard to have conversations on race because it's important that we bring people into the conversation. But we also want to be there ourselves. (laughs) We want to be learning things ourselves. I feel like I learn something new every week. It's part of the joy of doing what we do, I think. Yeah. We're talking about these big, overarching episodes that we did at the very beginning. Like we, We really felt like it was important to kind of tackle education and healthcare, labor, 
land back, police brutality. These were like the big issues of our time. And we had these amazing experts to help us look at them, unpack, explore to see what was happening. I know we were only supposed to choose one favorite, but just because <laughs> I have an opportunity here, I'm going to drop in another favorite. But one of my favorite episodes represented a milestone or a turning point for this podcast was the slap that was heard around the world. So at yeah. the 2022 Oscars, Chris Rock, as everyone will probably remember from those Oscars. It's the one thing everyone's going to remember, and that's pointed out in this episode. Chris Rock was hosting. He made a joke about Jada Pinkett Smith's bald head. Will Smith proceeds to get up on stage and slap Chris Rock. And it was one of those cultural moments that everybody was talking about. We got Cheryl Thompson a fabulous guest. She's a performance prof at TMU, Toronto Metropolitan University. And partially because you have that rapport with her, but also because of the depth of her knowledge, that episode broke down that mm. slap in a way that I hadn't seen before. And I think we were all of a sudden able to focus on a very newsy event, and it did incredibly well. And Cheryl provided this incredibly intersectional approach looking at gender and race and power and how all of those things intermingled. Historically, comedians, they punched up. So they would make fun of the nobility class because it's fun to make fun of rich people, <laughs> right? Yeah. They would make fun of power, essentially. Yeah. So the idea that a black comic would come in that stage, use that pulpit to make fun of the least powerful people in the room, it kind of makes you pause and say, comedy is really in a crisis because it's as if the comedian doesn't understand power anymore. That was Cheryl Thompson. She's amazing, huh? Even though that was an event in time, going back and listening to that episode, which I did last night, there's still mm. so much to take away from it, which is one of the other things I love about this podcast is even though it was one moment in time and it was now a year and a half ago, the conversation still stands. I love that you're talking about going back because I did that too. I want to bring in our other producers who are here too because it was around this time that they joined the conversation. I've got with me Atika Kaki and Danielle Piper and I just want to spend a moment with each of my wonderful producers. I'm just going to reach out to Athika for a minute. We both are New York City transplants. We live in Toronto, moved to Toronto at different times. That is our entry point with each other. Mm -hmm. But the way that I was introduced to you is someone who really wanted to look at culture and race in America and now North America. Yeah, I think one of the prompt questions you had texted us in prep for this episode was, when did you first become aware of race? And I think for me, as a person of color who grew up in a fairly homogenous suburb in the Pacific Northwest outside of Seattle, I was always aware of race because I was always a little bit different from other people from a cultural, religious, racial perspective. I was a week into my undergrad living away from home for the first time when 9-11 happened. And I went to school in a very small town in eastern Washington. So that was definitely a politicizing moment for me. In some ways, it put me on this trajectory of having a, an even increased awareness of identity in a post 9-11 world. That post 9-11 world. I remember thinking, oh, my goodness, everything's changed. Like my entire identity has changed. Yeah. Everybody's, yeah. you know, the geopolitics of the world has changed. So you're talking about yourself as a Muslim American, South Asian woman. Yeah, that was when I started to use my own voice in a way that has been a, a through line in all of my endeavors since then. And Atika, the idea of that first moment of when we thought ourselves as racialized, I think is partly because I went back to listen to a bunch of episodes last night. And one of them was with the Reverend Kyodo Angel Williams. And in, in which she says that one of the ways that we should think about race is by asking our own selves, when is that moment that we understood ourselves as racialized beings? And this, of course, applies to folks of color, but also white folks. And just because we're working so hard every week on this podcast about race, I really did want to take a moment 
this is very mission driven work that we do. And yeah. so I want to just acknowledge that everybody here in this virtual room really has worked hard to think about race. And that is part of the work that we do as journalists at Don't Call Me Resilient. All the producers are very much invested in the work that they do. Danielle Piper, who's joining us from British Columbia, I know that you have a story about the first time that you thought of yourself as a racialized person. So around the age of three, mm. I remember watching cartoons. My mom and my brother were behind me having some conversation. I wasn't really listening. But mid-conversation, my brother says, white people. And I whip around and, I'm, and the first question out of my mouth is like, there are white people? My mom, that was like the first time I've ever heard her cackle. Like she thought it was so funny. I was floored. Obviously, I knew that I looked different from people like Jen and Jen looked different from people like Atika and so on and so forth. But I didn't realize that they had labels. I didn't realize they had classifications. And I didn't realize those classifications meant there were going to be differences in how you were treated. Mm -hmm. And so at the tender age of three, I was thrust into the world of race and how race is a determinant for how you're going to be treated for the rest of your life. I was thinking about that myself, like, what's my story? And I'm sure there's so many, many of these moments. And I think one of the things that is suggested in that podcast, think about who you are first so that you can go out into the world and be a better activist, be a better player, be better in the world as somebody who understands where you're coming from yourself. And so I just thought about the first immediate story that came to my mind. I'm already in grade five, which means for sure that I've been confronted with race before because like you, Atika, I grew up in a neighborhood in which I was one of few racialized kids in my school. I was in grade five, you know, teachers playing a documentary in the classroom and it's about India. It's about poverty in India. And a woman walks across the screen in a sari and a jug of water on her head and a baby on her back kind of thing. And then someone in the room yells, hey, Vinita, that's your mom, right? And I'm thinking, that's not my mom. <laughs> like, that's not my mom. I mean, I'm in grade five, so I'm no baby. But I'm like, no, my mom's at home. She's probably wearing polyester. She's probably going crazy cooking and cleaning, probably really overburdened with that kind of North American, quote, housewife work. And it's, it was nothing to do with what was on the screen. But I remember then at that moment, I was very clearly othered. Like we're watching this other world thing that's happening across the globe about poor people in India. It was one of those split seconds where I'm like, where it's the first moment that I remember feeling racialized. Well, that's one of those moments. And how does that impact us, you know, continuously? How do we stop that loop? How do we stop that othering of ourselves? I know I, we have to get into the business of what we came here for, which is to talk about the episodes that I've asked each of you to choose. May I go to Danielle? Danielle, we, we talked a little bit about Cheryl Thompson already. And I know that the episode that you selected has to do with Cheryl Thompson. Since we're also talking a little bit about our personal experiences, I feel like this episode might connect with you personally as well. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the episode first? Yeah, so the episode has to deal with a bunch of lawsuits that are currently happening in the States and in Canada, though at a much smaller scale. There are a bunch of studies that have pretty much shown that there is causation with hair relaxers. If you don't know what hair relaxers are, they basically chemically straighten curly Afro hair. And they have been marketed to Black women for a number of generations as a means to assimilate, to, to put it gently, but to, to look more white. Um, and these relaxers have now been found to give certain forms of cancer. And there are thousands of women coming forward with uterine cancer or other types of cancers that they have linked back to relaxers. This episode was particularly interesting to me for two reasons. One, anytime I go for a job interview and I'm telling my mom about the job interview, the first question out of her mouth is not what are you going to say? It's not what you're going to wear. It's not um, what, do you, what have you written in your cover letter? It's what are you going to do with your hair? And that's because she knows and I know that unconscious racial bias is a thing and first impressions is a thing and that people often do judge you from the way that you look. And a huge factor in how I look 
is your hair. When I heard about these hair relaxers, not just damaging your hair, but damaging to your body, and that thousands of women now had to live with the reality of fighting for their life with cancer, I, I knew that was a story that we had to cover. And tell us briefly some of the things that Cheryl does cover in the episode. So Cheryl covers a long history of how relaxers came to be, how were they marketed towards Black women. She speaks about how the internalized racism that we even experience and how we treat each other based on how our hair looks, from dreads to braids to afros to chemically straightened hair. Cheryl really goes into the deep history of why hair matters to Black women and why it seemingly matters to everyone else who has to look at them or judge them on a regular basis. Cheryl literally wrote the book on this, right? A Beauty in a Box. Those lawsuits are ongoing. Those are class action lawsuits. There's one in Canada, I believe, many in the U.S., if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. They're about 7,000 to 8,000 now in the U.S. In Canada, we last I checked, it's only two women who filed a lawsuit. We will see how far it goes in Canada. We're going to play a short clip from that conversation with Cheryl Thompson now. In this moment, she's talking about how challenging it is for her as a Black Canadian woman to have to assimilate into the white-dominated workforce. To be very honest with you, anybody who is the offspring of, especially that generation of Caribbean immigrants who came in the 60s, 50s and 60s and 70s, my parents had to do that. Yeah. They wore a different face at work. And they did that for survival. Yeah. Right? And they changed their mother tongue. It changed the way they spoke. Yeah. And I remember as kids, me and my sister, we would hate it so much when my mother would run into someone that she knew and then she would put on that work voice that was like, you do not talk like that at home. <laughs> right. And we didn't understand it. And we were like, why is she being fake? And why? Obviously, as you grow, you realize that's called work tone because she wants to keep that job. <laughs> okay. And that's called assimilation that's forced assimilation yeah and that's why it's really hard for me now in my professional life to be in instances where it's almost like I have to do that mm. I'm registering oh my gosh it's like I'm living my mother's life but I was born here yeah why am I having to assimilate again into a system when this is actually the country of my birth and, and I know there are thousands of black women Canadian born who experienced the exact same thing. That was Cheryl Thompson, associate prof at TMU and author of Beauty in a Box. She's just so brilliant. Let's now turn to Atika Kaki, who is our associate producer and has had a large role in many of the episodes that went out the last few seasons. Tell us which episode you selected as your one to flash back to. The episode that I picked is called Palestine Was Never a Land Without People. And we originally published this episode on November 16th, 2023. So that was just a little bit more than a month after October 7th, the day that Hamas launched an attack on Israel, which resulted in an ongoing attack by Israel on Gaza. And at the time, our team was really grappling with meaningful ways to talk about what was happening. And we came across a professor of colonial history at the University of Victoria named Elizabeth Vibert. I think she had originally written in with a pitch to the conversation about some of her work. She has been doing oral history research to examine the historical and contemporary causes of food crises in various settings around the world. And one of her research projects includes working with Palestinians who live in a refugee camp in Jordan. As a historian who studies colonial paths, mm. she was making the case at that moment on November 16th that the rhetoric around Palestinians is barbaric or backwards, both historically but also in that contemporary moment were really rooted in a long history of colonizing narratives including the view of indigenous lands and indigenous people as mm -hmm. uncivilized. And she draws comparisons between what happened in Palestine to what has also happened in Canadian contexts and other contexts as well. 
One of the projects that Elizabeth is working on is a documentary film about the importance of preserving Palestinian food in exile. She basically said, if I do this interview, it must include Salam Gannett, who is the consulting producer and cultural and language translator for that project. And she is a person of Palestinian descent herself. I should also mention there is sort of a third guest in this episode as well. In the episode, we discuss their film, which is called Aisha's Story. And it's about a woman named Aisha who lives in a Palestinian refugee camp in Jordan. Her family are refugees who have been displaced twice over, first in 1948 and then again in 1967 to Jordan, to the camp that she now lives in. And one of the things that had been passed down over generations was this millstone that plays a huge role in her role as a person preserving food culture in exile. Can you set up the clip a little bit for us? We actually struggled and internally grappled with the idea of talking about food culture. Like, does that make sense at a time when we're seeing the sort of horrors that we're seeing on our phones every day? And so we actually posed that question to Elizabeth and to Salam. And this is a bit of the conversation where they both discussed that with you, Vanita. Amazing. Thank you. So we're going to play that clip. Elizabeth, why is it important that we talk about this relationship with agriculture and the land at this moment? The relationship with agriculture and the land is the original colonizing relationship. The colonizers came in, viewed indigenous peoples worldwide as not moving and living appropriately and productively enough on the land, and used that as a massive justification to dispossess the indigenous peoples of their land. It was the underlying justification for dispossessing people. And that played out, as we've seen through early Zionist rhetoric about backward, primitive, unproductive, even lazy Palestinians, and then the British colonial rhetoric, which continued in that vein. The rhetoric today of backwardness and even animal-like qualities that is coming out even of some cabinet ministers in the Israeli government, that dehumanizing rhetoric and failure to recognize a sophisticated and ancient but also very contemporary culture, that's with us today. And it is grounded in ideas about land use and agriculture and food mm. production. And Salam, did you want to add to that as well? It's important to talk about Palestinian food and how Palestinians carry their culture through food because although millions of us are scattered in a diaspora, it is the food that we carry, the food that we pass on is part of our identity. That's how we remain what we are. In my own house, I would cook many things, but when it's something Palestinian, my son is sure to know that this is a Palestinian dish that my mother made for me so that I will teach him how to make it in the future so that he will keep that with him. It's our minute connection to somewhere far away that we don't have. I think you're talking partly about how much you can love land, but also what land produces and what that brings mm -hmm. to you and your families and your communities. Yeah. How that sustains body and life, but also and memory. Community. And memory, of course, keeps memory alive. That was such a deep conversation at such an important time. That's from the episode called Palestine Was Never a Land Without People. Let's turn to you, Jennifer. Tell me about the episode that you selected. So the one that I selected was from November 2022, and it was about long COVID and how it disproportionately affects women of color. Our collective mindset was coming out of the pandemic, whereas there was this whole population of people who were living with the consequences of the pandemic and continue to now. This is still happening, yeah. and this population is still feeling these effects and Margot Gage Whitfleet, who was our guest on that episode, she's a social epidemiologist at Lamar University in Texas, and she studies health disparities, especially as they relate to long COVID. And she is living with long COVID herself. I should point out here, too, that our then producer, Ligia Navarro, who pushed for this episode, also is living with long COVID and so could understand the implications of it, what stakes there were and how undercovered it was and probably continues to be 
it was this wonderful conversation that mixed both personal with research. And the clip that I chose to share, starting with you, Vanita, asking, why is it that so many women of color are getting COVID and then beyond that, getting long COVID? In America, women of color, especially African-American women, tend to be heads of households. These women are really driving a lot of economics. They're the number one woman in the workforce. We are also heavily in the essential worker category. So you're going to see us as healthcare workers making your Starbucks coffee. You're going to see us checking out your groceries and in heavy numbers. And then when the pandemic hit, it's hitting those essential workers first who happen to be mostly women and predominantly African-American followed by Latina. And then we're bringing this back to our community. You know, the fact that I could work from home is a luxury and I get that. And most people in these essential functions couldn't do that. So they had to go out or otherwise they couldn't eat and they couldn't feed their children. So they, so they had to take that risk. I think that's a contributing factor of why, why it really spread like wildflower. And even before COVID hit, we all know that the health disparities in these communities with lack of access to health care, all of these things play a role. We have higher rates of diabetes, of these preconditions, which if you get COVID does not help you out at all. So then you're going to see higher rates of damage and carnage in these populations. We've been hearing a little bit more about long COVID, but still not enough. Why do you think there hasn't been as much attention from governments and from media paid to long COVID? I think governments are scared because long COVID, you can't fit it into a neat little box. You can't give someone a test and say, you have long COVID. So then where does that put you when, as we know, long COVID can leave you disabled. For example, my allergist said, let me tell you, there are some people I've spoken to or I've seen in my clinic, they will never recover. COVID did such damage to their body, they will never be part of the workforce again. So governments get afraid of that and the economic like ramifications from that and the fact that they might have to be taking care of this huge number of people. What are you going to do with that? Yeah, people have been calling it a mass disabling event. The U.S. government decided that long COVID should be covered as a disability. Are people having trouble accessing the disability benefits or is this something that's actually helped? You bet. <laughs> it sounds nice and it's great. And I'm so glad that all of our advocacy work paid off to get the government to actually listen. But it's not that we just magically get disability. People are having a fight, they get rejected. So just imagine all of the women, because it's mostly impacting women whose employers are not making any type of solutions to help them and probably don't even believe them and don't really care. And if they do care, you know, there's not much they can do anyways, because they're thinking about the economics of the situation. That was Margot Gage Whitfleet, who, by the way, runs an amazing Facebook support group for women of color living with long COVID. I have to admit that <laughs> choosing a flashback episode for me was really, really hard. It was kind of like, you want me to choose which one of my kids I like more? So I'm not sure if I really want to pinpoint a favorite episode I do want to mention a few. One of those conversations was with Carl James, who is at York University, a longtime scholar of education. I considered him to be like an academic rock star. And when I was like, I wonder if Professor James will speak to me and then reaching out to him and then actually getting a personal phone call back from him and him spending the time to explain the issues, why we need to sound the alarm about our education system, particularly in Ontario, but across Canada, and especially for young Black men. It was just such an amazing moment for me. And that conversation with Carl James, we had it with a teacher in a high school. 
in a neighborhood that we call Jane and Finch here in Toronto. The conversation took place right in the middle of COVID. And I would say that conversation really holds up. Here's a short clip from that conversation now. So this idea of resilience, this idea of being able to confront the issues is something that is talked about for racialized students and um, minoritized students and others. But they become trapped in that idea of their resilience because they can come back no matter what we do. So the system never moves because the system can remain the same and their resilience will be able to bring them back. So there is that fear I have about the cruelty of thinking about that group as resilient and not enabling them to be successful. That was Carl James from York University. He works so tirelessly in this area, and I I definitely think you should give this episode a listen. And I'm just going to mention two other people. Ellen Gabriel, one of the forerunners of what Canadians may know as the Oka resistance moment. She was one of the strong female leaders at the time in there, and we got to interview her. In that episode, she speaks with Anne Spice, and Anne Spice was a very significant land defender, especially around the Suetan territory. And it's really a lovely conversation between two Indigenous land defenders of two different generations. Here's a short clip from Anne Spice, who is a Tlingit member of the Kwanlin Dun First Nation and is an assistant prof at TMU. I think the land defender is not a title that you claim for yourself. It's an action, and it's about the practice of actually being on the land and reclaiming ancestral territories and territories that are under attack. Here's another clip from that episode with Ellen Gabriel, a Ghanaian Gahaga artist, filmmaker, and activist. The women are title holders to the land and are the protectors of the land, and the, the men's obligation is to protect the women who are protecting the land title to the land goes through us and um, we have not been you know, respected as, as we see in the Indian Act, it attacked the authority and the roles of women. So it's a huge obligation because we need to fight a government that has, you know, infinite amount of resources, both financial and human. And so you need to be strong in what you know is your obligation and why there is such an importance to it, which is Without the land, we're nothing. There are so many other amazing episodes. The third one, if I'm allowed to mention one, one more, is a conversation between two scholars who are speaking about two very different communities, but they're both speaking about famine and starvation as a tool of colonialism, as something that was in the toolbox of colonial occupiers. One of them is speaking about the Canadian experience and how the first prime minister openly withheld food from Indigenous populations to induce starvation so that the Canadian government could, quote, clear the plains, meaning make room for white settlers coming into Canada. Here's a short clip from that episode with one of our guests, James Daschek at the University of Regina. He's the author of Clearing the Plains, Disease, politics of starvation, and the loss of Aboriginal life. We don't tend to think about that really provocative statement by Prime Minister MacDonald about keeping people on the verge of starvation to reduce the expense. I think he was bragging that he was controlling the population, weaponizing food, and he wasn't embarrassed about it. He was actually quite proud that he was able to control 20,000 Indigenous people as cheaply as possible. He wasn't wasting the taxpayers' money. What that did was that food as a means to control the population ensured the quick construction of the Canadian Pacific Railway, which is the backbone of the nation, especially here in Western Canada. And the other person that he's speaking with is a scholar of South Asia who's looking at the way the British used starvation to clear areas and to control populations in India. He's Janam Mukherjee, professor at TMU and the author of Hungry Bengal, War, Famine, and the End of Empire. I think the prevailing condition of India at the inception of World War I is colonialism. Colonialism is the most dominant force politically, societally, geopolitically, etc. So we have to see colonialism itself as a sort of authoritarian regime 
with resort to famine throughout the colonial period as a way to subjugate the colonized population. That conversation is, some, is one that I had wanted to have for a long time. The idea of comparing these very large histories was very scary. I wasn't sure if it was going to work, but the conversation is terrific. And that's all I got to say. <laughs> we've had a lot of student journalists that have come through the doors we've also had a lot of producers that have also had a hand in producing episodes and so i just wanted to mention their names there's no particular order here but that's lija navarro Boke saizi susanna ferreira nahid bui and Haley lewis Anoa Korku, Latifa Abdin, Ibrahim Deer, Vaishnavi Dandekar, Ali Nicholas, Ritika Shanoi, Marissa Sitia Morin, Hussein Haveliwala, Catherine Ju, Vicky Mochama, and Imriel Morgan. And our original sound designer was Reza Daya, who was followed by Lija Navarro, Rematula Sheikh, and Krish Dinesh Kumar. With me today was Atika Kaki, Jennifer Moroz, and Danielle Piper. Thank you all for joining me. Thanks for having us. This was fun. Yeah, thank you. It was. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And don't forget, every two weeks over the summer, starting next week, we'll be bringing you the best of Don't Call Me Resilient. We'll be rerunning some of the conversations we talked about today, as well as a few other favorite episodes from team members. We hope you tune in and have a great summer. We'll see you back here in the fall. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch with us, you can reach us at dcmr at theconversation.com or on Instagram. We are at Don't Call Me Resilient Podcast. Don't Call Me Resilient is a production of The Conversation. The series is produced and hosted by me, Vinita Srivastava. This episode was co-produced by associate producer Atika Kaki. Krish Dinesh Kumar did the sound design and mixing. Our consulting producer is Jennifer Moroz. Lisa Verano is the managing editor of The Conversation Canada, and Scott White is the CEO. Zaki Ibrahim wrote and performed the music we use on this podcast. The track is called Something in the Water. Maybe we find something in the water.